as we commit ourselves to be to, to a new year, a year of idealism, where cynicism is a sin. One is to recommit to all the prophetic and rabbinic values. We know it because there is, according to the Jewish tradition, a still small voice inside each of us. That's the poetry of the Jewish tradition. There's a still small voice, a small piece of us. That's the piece of the divine is somehow inside us. And this, this still small voice propels human beings to do lovely things at lovely times. And then the question is, well, how do you depict the still small voice? Obviously, it's impossible. And so what I did pick was something small, something very small, unpretentious, little, that is to evoke in some way the notion of the still small voice, and it's the dash. And what's interesting about the dash is it's used in two different ways. In one way, the dash is used to join the years of someone's birth and the years of someone's death. And I, I picked a person for whom that's what this is. This is their birth and their death. So and some people thought, well, that's silly because it looks like this person got younger. <laughs> but actually, it's B.C. And once it's B.C., we know that this is... If you weren't here last night, who is this? If you weren't here last night, who is, who is this? What? Were you here last night? Oh, you don't count. I mean, you count, but... Okay, so it was Moses. This is, Mo according to, the, to archaeologists or s s anthropologists or silly people, <laughs> this is the year that he was born, 1393. And what is beautiful about this is it expresses a Jewish idiom. The Jewish idiom is, is we wish everyone long life. You should live to 120. It comes from Moses, who lived 120 years. But what's interesting in the, in the Jewish tradition is it doesn't matter what these numbers are. What matters is the dash. Everyone has the same dash, the same length of dash, regardless of how long the years are. The dash also, it's an interesting word in English, it represents what life feels like especially as one gets older. It's just moving faster and faster and faster. But the reality is, it's all about what we make of the dash of our life. And it's motivated by that still, small voice inside us. And according to the Jewish tradition, the, next, the, the other fabulous use of the dash comes in Martin Buber's classic description of what People really, I'm sorry, thank you. What people really try to do in their relationships. They try to have relationships that are profound, that understand and see the other person, which always retain their own sense of individuality and integrity, but at the same time, they form a new persona, as Soloveitchik describes. And... What's interesting is, if you don't have the dash, you get the letters I-T. It becomes an it. You put the dash in, and all of a sudden it becomes I-thou. And so the whole idea last night was to sort of talk about how the Jewish tradition has this idea of a still small voice that we respond to by doing as much as we can to infuse our lives with meaning. And the mo most important way to infuse our lives with meaning is through relationships we have with other people. And now you know why there's a dash up on the board. And then we come to the Akedah. The Akedah, the story, the binding of Isaac, it's the same story every single Rosh Hashanah. The Akedah is the story in which it begins by saying, 
God decides to test Abraham, Anissa. God is going to test Abraham. How? He tells Abraham to take his son. Which son? The one you, your only son. I have two sons. Uh, Take the one you love. I love them both. Take Isaac. Take him to a hill. I will show you. And there I want you to sacrifice him, his life, as a test of your fidelity to the God of this universe. That's the story. For most of us growing up, it was a very, it, it, it either was an uncomfortable story or it was a hideous story. And I know there have been some Jews who've said it should be taken. Chapter 22 of the book of Genesis should come right out. Take it out. And we've spent years with one recurring message. The recurring message is the Torah is not a newspaper account of anything that really happened. Except in the grossest, broadest sense, the history of the Torah is not history that happened literally. The Torah is the great spiritual religious text of the Jewish people, and like every religious text, it is poetry. It is narrative poetry. Every story, every passage is there to teach us something not about God, but about us. And if we understand we're to learn who we are by seeing ourselves and the dilemmas of human beings reflected in the Torah, then this book soars. The five books of Moses soars. If we're looking at it as if it is a record of what God did and miracles and plagues and this gets punished and this and dies and this. It means one hasn't understood what the Torah is. And the way we know it is, not because some professor says so, certainly not because I say so. It's never about what I say. All I do is explain what the rabbis, the people who shaped what we all know as Judaism, what did they say this book was and how it should be read? And they all say one overarching thing. This book is never to be read literally. Boy, it's, tr- it's, it's a good rule of thumb for almost any document. But the Torah in particular is never to be read Literally, every word, every passage, sometimes every letter in the Torah is interpreted. There's commentary. There's midrash that explains what the Torah means. The Jew does not care what the Torah says. The Jew cares what the Torah means. And it's the meaning of Torah that is the power of a tradition 3,000 years old, which leads to the Kohanim blessing us on behalf of something that we are the inheritors of. And the genius of the Jewish tradition is not in the literal reading of the text. It's in the interpretation of the text and the commentary of the text. And, again, we've talked about it before. It's the one midrash that is worth my saying again is the way in which this story culminates. And the story culminates with Abraham preparing to sacrifice his son Isaac. And the heavens are weeping. And the angels are weeping. This is not in the text. It's all in the midrash. And Abraham is weeping, and Isaac is weeping. 
By the way, so we all remember, how old is Isaac? 39. When I was young, I always imagined this was a bar, <laughs> bar mitzvah bucher. It isn't a 13-year-old child. It's a grown-up child. It's an adult child going with his adult father to a mountain where the two of them are going to participate in a sacrifice and one is going to lose his life. And at the moment of the sacrifice in the Midrash, heavens are weeping, the angels are weeping, Abraham is weeping, there's so much water, it dulls the knife. And in the Midrash, the angels say to God, haven't you had enough? And so God says, yes. And then God says in fabulous Midrashic fashion, he tells the angels to go tell Abraham to stop. Now remember, it was God who told Abraham to do the sacrifice. Now it's God telling the angels to relay the message he should stop. So the angels rush to Abraham, and they say to Abraham, stop the sacrifice. And in the Midrash, Abraham says to the angels, oh no, God, God's self told me to take the life of my son. God, God's self has to come tell me to stop. God has to have the God presence to look me in the face and tell me to stop. And the angels go back and report, and God says, okay. That's the one thing about God. In the Midrash, God always says, okay. Great. So God comes to Abraham, and God says to Abraham, stop. I don't need this. And in the Midrash, as you know, Abraham says to God, God, you made a promise to me that I would be the father of a great nation with as many as all the grains of sand on the seashore and the stars in the heavens. Didn't you make that promise to me? And God says, yes. And Abraham says, and whom was this legacy to be fulfilled through? And God says, through Isaac. Then you tell me to take Isaac and to slay him on this mountain? God says, yes, I did. And Abraham says to God in the Midrash, well, God, you broke your promise to me. And in the Midrash, God says, yes, I did. And Abraham waits a beat, and then Abraham says to God, well, God, I'm going to forgive you on one condition. And the condition is that every Rosh Hashanah, human beings will stand before you having broken their promises. As I forgive you this day, you will forgive them. You promise to forgive them. And God says, yes, I promise. I will always forgive on Rosh Hashanah. And then God says to Abraham, and just so I'll remember, I want Ken and Brian to blow the shofar every Rosh Hashanah morning. And when I hear the call of the shofar, I'll remember my promise. That as you forgave me, I forgive you. In the Midrash, the entire story is turned upside down. And it turns out in the end, God is being tested by Abraham. And there is something about that profoundly, not only wonderful, but profoundly Jewish in its understanding of life. It's never about God. It's always about people. And the overarching point of the Akedah which somehow, 
I mean, it's so obvious, but it gets lost so often. The story of the Akedah is there's no sacrifice. And in the text, it's God, God's self, who says to Abraham, don't do it. I don't need it. And we've talked about this before. In, it, in Abraham's time, everybody, everybody thought God wanted the slaying of the firstborn of everything, including the firstborn child, to win God's what? Favor. That that's how you thanked God. Child sacrifice was everywhere. And when Abraham goes to Mount Moriah, there's nothing unusual about that. The only thing that's usual is that at the end of the story, there is no sacrifice. That the Torah has a radically new view of what God is and our relationship to God is. And what it says is, you don't sacrifice your children. There is no God in heaven who wants child sacrifice. If somebody says, what's the Akedah all about? The Akedah is all about a tradition that says, radically new, starting today, no more. There's no God in heaven who wants us to sacrifice children. And that's why it's in the Torah. And that's why in the Torah it is not a sad story, a frightening story. The only way it would be frightening is if you believed it were true. If you believe there was a God that stupid. There isn't a God that stupid. It's not about God at all. It's a story. It's a prose poem with a point. And the point of the story is there's no God in heaven. There's no God on earth who wants child sacrifice. And every time we read the Torah, this is an exalting story. And then what one does is one looks and sees about all the other wrinkles and interesting things in the story. And so I want to offer you one that comes out of this year's theme. If we're talking about the importance of the I-thou relationship, and we read this story, it is not immediately clear if there's any I-thou in this story at all. Where is, the I, where is the profound relationship? And if you go to the Midrash, the Midrash finds one. The Midrash finds it in the relationship between Abraham and Isaac. And I remind you, it's not child and parent. It's adult child and adult parent. It's two generations with a shared vision. And the way this is expressed in the text is, there's a refrain. I think you know the refrain. Time and time again, it describes Abraham and Isaac going to the mountain, going up the mountain. And what it ultimately says is, they went together. Yachad, they went together, over and over. That's the refrain of this prose poem. They went together, they went together, they went together. Despite the questions, despite the uncertainty, they went together. But there is nothing between God and Abraham that seems to be I thou. And Soloveitchik, again, who was the the creator of what is now modern orthodoxy, but the reason why one reads Soloveitchik is, it's all, when you read Soloveitchik, it's all midrash. The genius of the great Rabbanim, wherever they are, is that it's all about showing us how the midrash takes the text and infuses it with extraordinary meaning. And so, Soloveitchik does a long treatise on 
what is the I-thou relationship, and how does it apply to the Akedah? And what is interesting is, when one is in an I-thou relationship, we talked about this last night, each individual must retain 100% of their own integrity. One does not give oneself over. It is not the classic mysticism where one becomes one with, in a sense of giving anything up about one's own self. It's not that there's something bigger one gives oneself over to. No. Two authentic, separate human beings meet in a way that so enriches both of them that they become intertwined in a larger entity, what Soloveitchik calls a new persona. It's not that they are a couple, says Soloveitchik, they are one. They're a new one. They're a new person. For as long as that moment lasts, and what happens, the, the wonderful thing about an I-thou relationship is, when the I-thou moment is over, both the I and the thou are never the same. They're always linked. In a way, even if there is a degree of separation, they're still holding hands. And there's always an opportunity for the I-thou intimacy to return. I-thou is an expression of emotional intimacy. There's a beautiful line in the book of Genesis. A man leaves his mother and his father and cleaves to his wife, and they become, do you know the rest of it? And they become one flesh. That's the Torah, book of Genesis. A man leaves his mother and his father, cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh. This is essentially not a sexual reference. It's an I-thou relationship reference. By becoming one flesh, they become one new persona. And it's not only in marriage. It happens in families. It happens between brothers, sisters. It happens with friends where one becomes so close, there's a moment of such recognition and appreciation for who the other person is and how they relate, that at that moment it is I-thou. Emotional intimacy. And lest we fear, there are all degrees of I-thou. It's not all or nothing. Nothing in Judaism is all or nothing. Nothing in Judaism is all or nothing. It's all come as close as you can, including I vow, with someone one loves passionately, deeply, profoundly, come as close as you can. And the challenge is to remain as close as one can, even when there's physical distance and sometimes emotional distance. And when one does that, when one enters into the I thou, one thing does happen. Each person, the I and the thou, must sacrifice. They don't sacrifice themselves or their integrity or their personality, but they do sacrifice something very human. They give up thinking they are the center of the universe. A very human trait 
is for every human being to see the world from behind their eyes and to think, everybody is in this play for me. There's so many people in this world. And each one thinks the world's about them. In the I Thou moment, each person realizes it's not about them. It's about something bigger that joins them forever. And they become one flesh. They become in and of themselves, anew. And what's happened in the Akedah is at the very, very end, especially in the Midrash, but in the text as well, at the very, very end, it is God, God's self. God realizes that the only way this works this is all poetry, you understand. The only way it works is if God gives up thinking God is everything. In the Jewish tradition, God does not think God is everything. In the tradition, God is the Shekhinah. God is the still, small voice that dwells in the human heart and pulsates through the entire universe. But one of the things God does is God sacrifices his sense of being only. It is in relationship that one becomes one. And when we say, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, God is one. It is a statement by the Jewish tradition that God gives up exclusivity to be the one in all relationships, in all I vows. And if we're supposed to learn from the Torah, it's not about God, it's about us. It's telling each of us what we want to try to do. What we want to try to do in our entire lives is be open to other people in a way that embraces them with powerful emotional intimacy. And to do that, it's not about any one of us. The one is the larger one expressed in the I-thou relationship. As we read the Akedah this morning, may that be a May that be a message that we hear reverberating in a text which on a surface seems to be problematic, but in essence is one of the loveliest, most powerful messages in the entire Jewish tradition. And we all say, 